it's, it's good to be back and continue to study the Word of God. And um, we, we, we began uh, a while back in, in Genesis uh, chapter 25 and going through Dr. Wearsby's outlines. He does such a good job of outlining these things. I love to use his outlines. And he noticed that these three chapters, which deal with Isaac, he broke them down into each chapter looking at a, a particular aspect of Isaac and his life and his character. In chapter 25, we saw Isaac as a father and as a husband. And last week, we started in chapter 26, and we got, oh, I don't know, about 21 or 22 verses through there. And we saw that Isaac is a pilgrim and a stranger in the land. And, of course, that's us, folks. We're pilgrims and strangers down here. And breaking it down, just to, by way of review before we continue, we see that Isaac, you know, in the first few verses of that chapter, he, he faced his father's temptations. In verse 1, it said there was a famine in the land. That's something his father had gone through. And, of course, we commented that we often face the same temptations that our fathers have faced. As a matter of fact, I don't think things have changed all that much over the 6,000 years of man's history. I mean, uh, people are still people. Human nature hasn't changed, and the temptations and the trials that we uh, face haven't changed. And uh, he, he faced this temptation. We saw initially, as he faced the temptation in verses 6 through 11, 11 that, that he tripped up with the temptation. And he repeated his father's sin. In verse 6, uh, he told the people, in verse 7, uh, he said, uh, she is my sister. He was afraid to tell the people of the land that that was his wife. His father had done the same thing earlier. And often, we repeat the sins of our fathers. And it just shows how important uh, the mother and the father is in the home because the children learn so much from observation. Even if it's not communicated verbally, it's communicated visually. It's communicated just by the model that uh, we live before them and the way we live our lives. And so initially, he, he tripped up. But when he was confronted, he did the right thing. He confessed his error. And, and he repented of his error. Now, it might be hard to tell right from this little passage about the repentance, but one of the ways we know there was a repentance that occurred is as you read the rest of the scriptures, you will never find Isaac repeating this sin. In other words, now he's, he's confronted it, he's confessed and repented of it, and it's behind him. And he doesn't repeat this particular sin again. So that's one good sign of repentance. Another way that we can see that is um, th you can tell there's a repentance because not only does he put it behind him, but he goes on forward and presses back on to the labor because he goes right back to verse 12 and then you find him, boom, and then Isaac sowed in the land. In other words, one of the things that <coughs> often prevents us from going on and, and working in God's field sowing and reaping, harvesting, laboring, getting in the yoke with Jesus. One of the things that prevents us from doing it is sin. It's almost like we know that when we have a particular sin that we happen to like, that we happen to repeat a lot, that um, has really become, we wear it like our old clothes. You know, we're comfortable in it. And Isaac was kind of comfortable in this thing earlier in the chapter. When we're in that condition, we almost know better than to try and labor and serve the Lord. And Isaac wasn't laboring right at that time when he was in that sin. It's almost like we know, well, one thing we know is the Holy Spirit is grieved inside of us. And uh, he's been quenched on the inside of us. And really the greatest witness we'll ever have is the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, we can go about in our own flesh and we can do some witnessing. But it just doesn't have the uh, power that the Spirit has. Because it's not by our might or by our power. It has to be by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the, the, the disciples, he says, you'll receive the Holy Spirit and you'll be witnesses unto me. And it's that Holy Spirit witness power. And when we're in sin, that Holy Spirit is quenched to the point where the witnessing power is not there. And we don't want to labor. But once we get in the closet and talk to God and confess the sin and repent of the sin, then... then that darkness is broken up. The clouds go away and the Spirit lifts up inside of us and then he's able to flow freely and the lights are back on and you see Isaac going right back into the fields. So, yeah, he tripped up initially, but, but he, he repented and then he turned right back to continuing into his father's labor. And when he did, notice how quickly God blessed him. Verse 12, 
that Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. You see, God doesn't hold a grudge. God didn't say, okay, Isaac, you know, you confessed this thing and you repented, but I don't know that I want to bless you right now. I'm going to test you for a while to see if I'm going to bless you. I want to make sure this is the real thing and you're just not just pulling my leg. Look, God wants to move in our lives quickly and help and, make a, and, and use us to bless those around us. Why? Because now is the day of salvation. God doesn't want to wait till tomorrow to save somebody. He wants to save people right now, today. Now is the acceptable time. And so God is ready to bless right now if we'll put sin behind us. If we'll keep a short account with God, God is ready to move in and to bless. And we see it right here. Same verse. As soon as Isaac sows, here comes the blessing. Get that sin behind, sow, and God blesses. Now, now that's not the way I think things are done uh, humanly, there's often a parole period. You know, person's on parole. We got to watch him for a while. We're not sure. We can't. But with God, God wants to move. God has great things in store for souls down here. I mean, He wants to get these souls. He wants to save them. He wants to cherish them. He wants to nurture them. He wants to grow them up, and He wants to use us as vessels. And as soon as we'll clean ourselves up as a vessel, He'll instantly pour in the Holy Spirit and start using us to bring forth the word to a thirsty world. And that's what he did right here. And we see Isaac as he continues in his father's labors. What kind of labors were his father involved in? Well, in uh, verse 18, we see Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. Uh, verse 19, And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. Verse 21, and they digged another well. I mean, he's continually into getting into the wells and, and going. Now, first off, understand where they are. They're out in a desert region, and it's important to have water. <laughs> we need water to live. So historically, I understand. But spiritually, Jesus speaks of the Word as water. And, and here's someone getting into the Word of God. He's digging into the Word of God. Even in the valley... Okay, even in the low points of your life, as a matter of fact, that's probably when we need the word more than any time in our life, is when we're low down and we're, we're, we seem to be down and out. The world has knocked us back on our keister. And that's the time that we need to look up and we need to spend time in the Word of God so that He can restore us, so that He can strengthen us, so that He can get us back on our feet again, so we can rise back up. And, and Isaac, he's digging in the valley. He and his servants, I mean, he's got a little Bible study group and they're spending time together. And they're getting into the Word of God, like we're doing here tonight. And that's the way God would have us to be, and that's the way Isaac was, and he was following in his father's footsteps. And we want to follow in our Heavenly Father's footsteps. And prayerfully, maybe we even have physical fathers that did this. And if not, maybe we can be the first father to start a tradition and a heritage for our children so they can follow in our footsteps. And they can get used to seeing us in the well, digging in the valley, spending time in the Word of God. And so Isaac does this. He diligently goes about pursuing the business that his father was in. And of course, what happens? There's the fruit that comes forth in his life. I noticed in, in these verses here, 18, 19, 20, 21, he was still in the land of Philistines while he was doing this, back on the map here. This yellow area here is the land of the Philistines. And he was over in Gerar. And he was digging his wells here in the valley of Gerar, just outside the city. The city's on a hill about 300 feet high. And he's down in the valley, and he's digging there, and he's coming up with the uh, wells of water. Now, of course, the Philistines need water. Everybody needs water. And so as soon as he digs a well and comes up with it, the Philistines come and strive with him and say, it's our water. Why? Well, it's their land. They must have figured it was their water. Now, I noticed every time they did this, Isaac would not strive back. He would not return fire for fire. He, he walked away from these battles. It's fine. The well's yours. You can have it. And he left, and he gave them the well. Now, I, I think of the difference between Isaac 
and uh, his, his brother. You remember he had a brother, a half-brother, Ishmael? If you go back and, and you study about Ishmael back in uh, chapter 16, speaking about Ishmael in chapter 16 and verse 11 and 12, when the Lord uh, tells Hagar what the child's name will be, that his name will be Ishmael, he describes him in verse 12 and says about Ishmael, he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. In other words, uh, Ishmael is the kind and every man's hand against him. Ishmael is the kind that if there's trouble coming his way, he's looking for trouble. If someone had tried this with Ishmael and he dug that well, there'd have been a war over it. Matter of fact, Ishmael doesn't wait for trouble to come his way. It didn't say every man's hand against him and then his hand. It said he'll be first. He usually starts most of the conflicts. Isaac is just the opposite. He starts no conflicts and he walks away from them when they come. Because it is an, it is an honor to cease from strife. It is an honor to cease from strife. People are going to come along with you sometimes in your life and they're going to strive with you and it is an honor not to engage. Now this takes a long time to learn. Isaac is a lot more mature than I am and I've had to learn these things and I've uh, someone come forward. Now that doesn't mean a physical fight. I don't fight anybody. I can lift about 30 pounds. I'm, I'm not crazy. But, I, but verbally, you know, verbally someone come with an argument my way about something, especially about the Bible, I might tend to strive back with them. I have learned now to disengage and to cease from it. I mean, not even to get involved, not even to let it, as they say, don't go there. <laughs> I mean, they may start and I'll try and change the conversation. And, and this is, is so important. Isaac is showing this. Isaac is showing humility and he's showing meekness. Now, I know he's meek at this point. You know what meekness is? Meekness is strength under control. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. The Lord Jesus Christ was meek. He was very powerful. Physically, he was strong, having been raised the son of a carpenter and doing that work. When, when he came into the uh, temple and he overturned the money tables, uh, those were huge tables. Those were not those little plastic things they sell at BJ's. Those were, those were big wooden things, you know. They were very heavy, like those huge picnic benches they had years ago. And, and, and he was overthrowing them. He's a powerful man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was under control. And he didn't strike back when somebody struck him. And he was struck. Not only that, physically, uh, as a man was powerful, he was God. <laughs> I mean, he had performed miracles. He had controlled the wind and the, and, the, and the seas and the waves. I mean, who knows what he could have done had he just had a particular thought, had he for a moment decided to be like Endora, you know, I mean, <laughs> on, on a TV show. I mean, the, the power that he had, according to the Bible, he holds together the very atoms within their body. All things consist by him. All he would have had to think was release, and all those atoms would have flown apart. It would have been a nuclear holocaust in front of him. And Jesus was under control. Meekness. Isaac is like him. How do I know this? Well, look in verse 16. In, in 26, verse 16, Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we are. That's an amazing thing. Here is this powerful person, Isaac, and these Philistines almost know that they can attack him and he won't strike back. That, that's, that's, we want to be like that. We want to get the Holy Spirit in our life to such a point that when attacked, we don't fight back even if we could win. We, we're not going, we want to have the meekness and the humility that when people strive, if they want the cloak, give them the cloak and the tunic too. You can have them both. We don't want to strive. You want that well? He gave him the well. If there's something you want, give it to them. Why? You're heaping coals upon their head. The Holy Spirit can use that and speak to them and, and show them this person is different. We are contrary to the world. We are different from the world. Isaac is modeling the, this for us right here in this passage here. He's modeling meekness for us. He, he, he digs a well. They take it from him. He moves on. He labors for another well. They take it from him. He moves on. Finally, God blesses him in verse 22, and he removed from thence and digged another well, and they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth, which means room. 
For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. You know why? If we will continue to model meekness, yes, the Lord will allow temptations, trials to come in our life, but after a while, what he'll do is when he sees that we're, we're behaving the way we're supposed to, as a child of the King, carrying the name of Jesus Christ highly, not taking, taking the reproach, not taking it personally, realizing it's not directed against us, that there's a spiritual battle going on, then the Lord will make even our enemies to be at peace with us. That's a promise in Proverbs chapter 16. And so, now we're going to see what happens. After this well is dug in 22, now we move on to the next section here, where we saw Isaac face his father's temptations, we saw him repeat his father's sin, we see him continue in his father's labor. Now in verses 23, it says, And he went up from thence to Beersheba. Now on the map here, I'll show you where Beersheba is. He had been sojourning in the land of the Philistines around Gerar. Beersheba is over here back in the land of Judah. It's pretty much actually considered the southernmost part of the nation Israel. They'll often speak of the nation of Israel as extending from Dan to Beersheba. And it's right in the region of Judah. And so he moves back to Beersheba. He leaves the land of the Philistines and he goes back to the land of the promise that his father had been in, in Beersheba. His father had been in that land back in uh, chapter, let me see if I can find where it is, 21. Back in chapter 21, around verse 31. This is a man following in his father's footsteps and praise the Lord, he had a godly father. He had a father that left him a good heritage. And so now, here in Genesis 21 and verse 31, uh, Abraham and Abimelech are together. You can see in verse 29, and Abimelech said to Abraham, and, and here they are together, the two of them are together. And in verse 31, they, they, they had just made a, uh, uh, an oath there, wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they swear, both of them. And thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up and fight call the chief captain of his host, and they returned in the land of the Philistines, and Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And so we see this is a place where his father had been. And it means the well of the oath. And so Isaac moves back there. He says, I'm going to get back closer to God. He, he says, I've spent my time now witnessing to the Philistines, and I want to get back to, the, to my roots where my father was and I want to get close to God again. Now, I guess the picture would be like this. Again, I told you last week, being in the Philistines is kind of like you and I when we leave church and we're in the workplace. <laughs> in the workplace is like where the Philistines are. And we're close to the land, we're close to church, but we're away from it for a little bit. But isn't it great to get back to Beersheba? And, and get back where God's people are and get back where there's liberty and the Spirit of the Lord flows freely and we can just say, praise the Lord! And we can talk about Jesus Christ and not feel that spirit of oppression around us like the Philistines. I mean, how many times we kind of feel ourselves holding our tongues when we're at the workplace and we want to say something about the Lord, but, you know, there's all those social pressures upon us. It's a spiritual battle. He goes back to Beersheba. He gets back to a nice church service. He's back in Beersheba. That's where we like it. We're back in, the, back in the church now. We're in Beersheba. Verse 24. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants digged a well. It's nothing like the church house. God's people getting together. Here comes God appearing. You know, every time we get together, God appears unto us. The Lord appears unto us. He speaks to us. I know about you. He speaks to my heart. He speaks to my heart. We get together and we open the Word of God and we sing praise and worship songs unto our God and we talk about what He's doing in our life and we give testimony to our God. He speaks to my heart. He says, fear not. I mean, the greatest comfort I have is, is in the church house with God's people. <clears throat> and here he, he, he speaks to, to Isaac. And then he goes on, historically and doctrinally, he says, 
I am with thee, of course he's with us, and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed. And again, historically, doctrinally, to whom is the seed going to come through? Abraham through Isaac. Ishmael is outside the covenant. How many times read this over and over and over in the Holy Scriptures? Again, there is so much deceitfulness out there. People believing that somehow God is the God of Abraham and Ishmael, where the scriptures are just so plain and clear. Within the same chapter here, we see it at least twice. Um, uh, verse 3 in the same chapter. The Lord had appeared. Verse 2, the Lord appeared. Verse 3, sojourn in this land. I will be with thee. I will bless thee unto thee and unto thy seed. I give all these countries. I will perform the oath which I swear uh, unto Abraham thy father. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars. I mean, over and over, it's Abraham, Isaac. Abraham and Isaac. It's not Abraham and Ishmael. That's, that's not the God of the Holy Bible. It's a different God. Praise the Lord. It's so plainly written. You can't miss it unless you want to run back to some other language and retranslate it. But if you just read it as it is right here in English, it, God makes it so plain and clear for us. And there it is. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac. And he promises that he's going to give the blessing and the covenant to Isaac and his seed. So how does he respond? By worshiping God, by building an altar, by pitching his tent there, by continuing to dig in the well, getting into the Word of God, getting the blessings paragraph marking in verse 26. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and Ahuzoth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. So now, here comes Abimelech, the same man that had asked him to leave in verse 16. He said, you're too mighty, why don't you leave our land? Okay, now I've, he's left the land. He's gone back to Beersheba. And now all of a sudden, Abimelech travels all the way over to him to talk to him. All right. Isaac says to him in verse 27, Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to see me, seeing ye hate me, and, and ye have sent me away from you? Now, this is interesting because, I mean, I'm different than Isaac. I tend to, you know, just be silent and bite my tongue when somebody comes to talk to me that I think doesn't like me or, or is my enemy. I just, I don't say anything. I, I don't, and Isaac is just being kind of frank with them, no guile an Israelite indeed, <laughs> just speaking what's on his mind. He says, what are you talking to me for? I mean, I thought you hate me. You sent me away. Don't you remember you guys told me to leave? I mean, didn't you guys hate me? Verse 28. And, and they said, uh, well, um, we certainly, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And uh, we said, let there be now an oath betwixt us even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Curious. Try and get the mindset of these guys. Now, these guys had asked him to leave. They had said, you're mightier. I think they were envious of him, and they asked him to leave. He thought they hated him. They now say, it wasn't that we hated you at all. As a matter of fact, when we had you leave, remember, we asked you to leave. All they did was, uh, verse 16, said, uh, go from us, for thou art mightier. All Abimelech and, and Phicol did at that time was just ask him to leave. He moved out of the city, he moved into the wells, and he had some problem with the local Philistine people there, but Abimelech didn't cause him any problems. He misinterpreted Abimelech of heart and mindset and motives with those of the local Philistines. Abimelech wasn't the one that strove with him. Abimelech wasn't the one that fought with him. Abimelech had just said at one point, would you please go away? You know, don't go away mad, just go away. Now it's curious here because I want to, you see, sometimes you know what we tend to do? We tend to paint everyone with a broad brush, with one big stroke. And, and we're, we're at the workplace, you see. And uh, let's say we're trying to witness to someone. And they say, uh, you know, not really. This isn't my cup of tea. Uh, I'm not really a believer. I'm kind of agnostic, atheistic. I want to talk about this stuff. Okay, so we back away. And then there's some other people at the workplace, and they may have seen the encounter or heard about the encounter, and they actually mock us out, and they strive with us a little bit. 
And this goes on for a while. And then finally, you know, we leave the workplace wherever we're a church one, and we're thinking about this, and we think of all of them the same. They all hate us. They all dislike us. They all hate our God. But that wasn't the case. There were some that really were striving with us, and some that just kind of pleasantly asked us, not now, now's not my time, now's not my cup of tea. Okay? But they didn't mock us, they didn't strive with us. But we put them all in the same grouping. Isaac was a little confused here. People, there, there are folks out there that are scorners, and there are mockers, and there are fools out there. There are also people out there that are confused in darkness, and at the moment they're, they may be wrestling and they may be asking for a little space to repent, a little space to think about it. Abimelech falls into that type of category. He, he, he says, look at uh, verse 29, and he says, as we have not touched thee, he didn't strive with him. He didn't take any of his wells. He didn't take any of his goods. Isaac had a lot of goods. Uh, we have uh, done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. And, and it's true, we did ask you to leave, but we did it in a, a peaceful manner. I mean, we disagreed with you about religion, but we weren't uh, uh, obstreperous about it or, or, or antagonistic about it. All we did was just say it's not our cup of tea. I mean, there are people that don't want to talk with us. I have some people at work that uh, I've tried to talk to, and they were very cordial and social, sociable about saying, it's not really for me. Now, they fall into the category of an Abimelech. They're not really my enemy. And not, none of them are really our enemy. Although I guess some of the scorners can be. <laughs> but they're really God's enemy. They're just uh, mad at our God, and they're trying to get at him through us. But we have, to, we have to have a little bit of discernment out there and realize it. Why? Because Abimelech now has had some time to think about Isaac. And you know what he thinks about him? He says this, verse 28, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. You know that word certainly is, is a pretty important word, especially if you read the Gospel of Luke. You read the Gospel of Luke and you will go through that, that Gospel. He starts out in the first five verses and, and in verse 4 he's saying, I wrote this entire Gospel that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And then he'll tell you there was a certain man and there was a certain Pharisee and there was a certain, and he'll use the word certain a number of times through the gospel. You know why he's saying these are real events? I'm talking to you about there's a reality. There's a certainty about this. And you know what? They watched Isaac and they say, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. In other words, you don't have a false religion. Abimelech, I've grown up in the land of the Philistines. I've seen Dagon, the false god. I've seen Molech. I've seen the statues. I've seen the phony priests, the Baal priests in the long black robes. I've seen all the things that they're doing. I've watched this stuff, and there's something phony about it. But with you, I could see certainly that the Lord was with you. What a testimony. Folks, I, the way we respond to the Abimelechs of the world will let them know if what we have is real. If, if, if when we are speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ with the Abimelechs of this world, with the Philistines of this world, and we find ourselves denigrating and coming down and descending to a level of fighting and arguing with them, just like everyone else fights and argues about every political opinion down here. <laughs> you ever see those shows where they got a liberal on one side and a conservative on the other and they're just going at each other? Okay, now if we descend and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ and our, our testimony and witness for Him gets down on the low ground, you can, you can never take the high ground by being in the valley. And, and Isaac never did that with Abimelech. He stayed on the high ground. He stayed close to God. Yet he fell once, and Abimelech saw him fall, and Abimelech saw him confess, and repent, and get back, and go on for the Lord, and Abimelech said, that's the real McCoy. That's the real thing. I know certainly the Lord's with that man, and that testimony 
spoke so strong to Abimelech that one Sunday morning when Isaac, you know, about 10 o'clock getting ready for church to start, all of a sudden into the parking lot pulls Abimelech and Phicol. And they come up and they're coming right into the church service. Because it's real. And they know, they know where Isaac's going to be. He's going to be at church on Sunday morning. He's not going to be on the golf course. And they, hey, we can find him at Beersheba. And they came looking for him. This is someone being drawn by God. Being drawn by God by the testimony of a Christian that stayed on the high ground. Yeah, we, he fell. But he confessed and he repented. And he went right back to serving the Lord. And right back to laboring in his father's footsteps. And, and when, when Abimelech saw that, you see, we... I'm not saying to go out and fall on purpose. Don't do any pratfalls. This is not a Chevy Chase religion, you know. I mean, this is not Saturday Night Live here. But the point is, when we're out there, we're going to fall, you know. But it, and, and they're watching. And when they see the reality of someone confess and repent and get back and then go on for God and God bless, those Abimelechs out there are going to come looking for it. God's going to draw them. And they're going to seek the Lord while he may be found. That's what's happening in Abimelech's life. That's what's happening here. And so he comes. Now, verse 30. So how does Isaac respond? Isaac has been through a lot with these Philistines. You and I have been through a lot sometimes with our co-workers at the... This is our opportunity here. Isaac is going to forgive and he's going to give. He's going to do both, just like the Lord does. And they made them a feast and they did eat and drink. In other words, he forgives them right away. If there were any past differences, if there were any slights that I thought in my mind, they're forgiven and forgotten. And not only does he forgive, he gives. He has a feast. He prepares for them a banquet. We may have had co-workers that we, we may have thought, you know, they, they don't like our God, they don't like our religion, they don't like our Bible, they don't like our church services. Folks, if they ever come, we want to receive them with open arms and we want to give them a banquet. We want to give them a banquet, the real God and the Word of God and the worship of the true God. And that's what he does right here. Verse 31, And they rose up, be times in the morning, and swear one to another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Isn't that what we're looking for? Didn't Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers? You know, this is the real peace. This is the peace that only the Prince of Peace can bring. This is not sitting down at some table, you know, negotiating some kind of pact between two nations. This is the sitting down and showing someone the true God and letting Jesus Christ move into their heart where the love of the Spirit moves in and the fruit is love, joy, and peace. And then there's a real peace that exists. Those are the peacemakers that God's looking for down here. Peace comes one heart at a time, one soul at a time, one Abimelech at a time. And that's, and that's what happened. And it's just a blessing to see them. In, now here's a Philistine and an Israelite. Dwelling in peace. You know what I saw uh, a while back on TV? I saw a big, heavy uh, guy, a Jewish guy with a beard, and, uh, and he didn't have the yarmulke on anymore, but he used to wear it, and he didn't have it on. And then another guy who was an Arab whose father was an imam, a Muslim imam. And this young man had been trained to be an imam. And he was going to follow and lead. An imam is like a pastor of, I guess, a, a, a mosque. And he was being trained for that same thing. And they moved to Chicago from uh, the Mideast. And when they were in Chicago, he heard some gospel preaching. The young man did. And he received Jesus Christ as his Savior. And, of course, his father was not too pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much shot the uh, imam uh, track that he was on. And, but this man uh, grew in his love for the Lord and went back to Israel. And I saw him hugging a Jewish man that was also uh, a believer, a completed Jew that believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And there they were. I mean, show that to the world. There's peace. Amen. It didn't take the UN to broker that. Amen. It doesn't, take, it doesn't take the United States coming in to do that. All it takes is Jesus Christ moving in to get the real peace. And there they were hugging each other. You know that could happen all over the Mideast if people would just 
take Jesus Christ and there'd be real peace. That's the peace of God which passeth understanding. The world would look at that and scratch their head. That would be the end of the suicide bombings. That would be the end of all the attacks or the end of all the retaliation. The end of the helicopter. That would be it. Just like those two men hugging each other I saw them on TV. Who did that? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ got the victory. That's peace. That's the kind of peace. And what happened on that verse 32? And, and the same day, it came to pass, the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged. And they said unto him, We have found water. Now remember, you're out in a desert land, you need water. Folks, we're in a desert land spiritually. We need water. Where are you, where, by, where are you getting quenching the thirst of your soul? Are you quenching it with the nightly news report? Are you quenching it with the radio stations? Are you quenching it with the newspaper? Or quenching it with the Word of God? That's what you want to do. Now Isaac, he's out there, and he knows they need water, and, and he's in, in Beersheba, and he's digging, and, and he hadn't found any water for a few days, and Abimelech comes, and he introduces him to the Lord, they make peace one with another, and instantly the blessing of water comes. Why? Because, let me tell you, when we go out and we serve God and we bring someone to God, there is like a wellspring of living water that flows up inside of us, the greatest high that we get. God moves in with a huge blessing, bigger than Billy Pasillo. A huge! <laughs> I don't, anyways, he, he moves in with, some guy on TV, he huge, he says it all the time. <laughs> and, but he moves in with a tremendous blessing when we're bringing someone to his son, when we're bringing forth the true peace. And that day, God blesses them. The Spirit rewards right away with new and deeper truths for us. I'll tell you, if, if we bring someone to the Lord, don't be surprised if the next time you read the Bible, God will show you something precious. There will be a new well of water that will flow in that Bible that you hadn't seen before. What's that all about? The Lord is just blessing you for bringing forth another new birth, being used to bring forth a new birth. And they called the name of it Sheba, verse 33. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. In other words, as a tribute to his father, he gives it the same name, the same good old name. There's some good old things. Jeremiah says in, in chapter 16, seek the old paths. That good old well, the good old King James Bible. We don't need to change it. We don't need to update it. It's got the same old name that it had back in our father's day. The same well that his father had named back then, the same well that was given back in the 1600s, the same well that Moody preached out of, the same well that Billy Sunday preached out of, the same well of words that uh, uh, Charles Spurden preached out of, the great revivals of Jonathan Edwards, all those things that happened, it's the same old well, it's Beersheba, it's the well of the oath. God promised he'd preserve his word, he's given it to us. And he keeps that name the same in tribute. We've got the good old King James Bible. What a blessing. There's a spiritual application for it. And so we see he trusted his father's God. And by the way, who are you trusting in? Who, who, who are you trusting in? Folks out there watching, who are you trusting in? You know, you've got to place your trust in somebody. I mean, believe it or not, your trust is being placed in somebody. So I don't trust anybody. I just trust myself. There you go. There you go. You're counting on yourself. It's not going to last too long. You're going to have breakdowns. You're going to stumble. You don't have perfect vision. You don't have perfect knowledge. Why don't you trust in God? Why don't you trust in God? Why don't you come to the well of living water in Beersheba? Why don't you make peace with God? Why don't you do it through Jesus Christ? That's the only way it can be done. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're seeing in this chapter. We are seeing how Isaac faithfully serves and loves and trusts God. And you know what? God blesses. And God brings forth a new birth. Abimelech got saved. What a deal. We'll see him someday in heaven. Abimelech made friends with God through Isaac. The chapter ends with uh, two little verses here. Uh, he's a pilgrim and stranger down here, Isaac is. And here's his one boy, Esau. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. <laughs> this is a, this is a, a sad thing. Um, 
in, in, in front of all this, looking at Isaac as a father, looking at how Isaac was as a husband, looking at how Isaac was as a pilgrim and stranger, Esau is watching all of this unfold be, before his eyes and is rejecting it. He's rejecting it. This is a, a sad truth that, that God wants to, to paint in his word. Why? Because God respects free will. God is not going to make anyone become a believer. There's no such thing as unconditional election. There's no such thing as God irresistible grace forcing. God says to Esau, you can witness your father. You can grow up with Isaac as your father and Abraham as your grandfather. And Esau did. And he rejected the entire witness, the entire lifestyle that his father lived. Watching the blessings that God gave to him along the way. This has happened throughout the centuries as men have loved God with their whole heart and mind and soul and strength and served God and walked with God only to have children say go spirit go thy way and you hear it over and over and over the sad thing I see sometimes is uh, people blaming the parents <laughs> as if it's their fault I mean, what more can a parent do other than love God and give a witness and an example of what it's like to walk with God? It's not the parent's fault. The child has to make the decision as to whether or not he'll walk with God, whether or not he'll receive God. And Esau wanted nothing to do with him. Esau had turned away the birthright. He sold it for pottage. And here, he turns away from the witness. Now, it's curious. He's now of age to get married. And it does. And notice it says, he took to wife. He took to wife. It gives the, the impression there that, that uh, Isaac and Rebekah didn't have much say in that. Now you think about how Isaac's wife was chosen for him by his father. And at the very least, Esau could have consulted with mom and dad, but he went out and took to wife these two girls who are both the daughters of Hittites. Now who are the Hittites? Well, the Hittites are the sons of Heth. They're found back in Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10 for the origin of these people. In Genesis 10, we see the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And in verse 6, we see the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mitzrayim, and Foot, and Canaan. Now, if you remember Canaan, Canaan was cursed by God. God cursed Canaan for a sin. And, and in verse um, 15, Genesis 10, 15, And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Heth is the father of the Hittites. Heth is someone born of a curse. And, and it's almost like Esau was saying, not only do I not desire God's blessings, but I'm not afraid of his curses. And I'm not willing to marry someone who comes from a cursed family. That's a strange thing. Because, you know, God, I want his blessings. And I don't want to be under his wrath or his curse. I want to get as far from his bad side as possible. I want to run real close under daddy's arms and stay close to him. Because uh, one of the best ways to, to not get hit by God is get in close. Because if you get too far out, that's when you just might get it by one of his hands. But if you're in close, he can't get you. You get in there real close there. So I like to get real close, you know. And, and Esau, he's not afraid of getting far from God and getting away with people, uh, hanging out with people and marrying people that have been cursed by God. It's a strange thing today because people uh, get a lot, they get away from God's blessing. And what they don't realize, and when you get away from God's blessing, you are under a curse. John was uh, speaking of this in his gospel in the third chapter. And Jesus was uh, uh, saying it too, about people who love light and those who love darkness. And he said, those, those who love darkness and hate the light, he, c he concludes that third chapter in verse 36, and he says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Those are the ones like uh, Isaac and those like uh, Abimelech that want to receive God's truth. 
But he that believeth not the Son not only shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's presently on him. The curse is on him. The wrath of God, the curse of God abides today. You know what we are by nature? We're like Hittites. We're under the wrath of God by our very nature. The sin nature has put us under God's wrath. God is at war with sin. There is a war going on down here, folks. It's the war of holiness against sin. It is a spiritual war. I see people, they have these signs on their bumper stickers on the car that says, No war. I, you know, I like that sentiment too, but the reality is there is war. Somebody started war a long time ago. It's the devil. He's the father and the author of sin. And there's a war going on of the devil and his sin against the holiness of God. And if you line up as a Hittite on the devil's side, you're, you're cursed and you're under the wrath of God. And Jesus stands there with open arms and he says, Come out from under that cloud. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden with sin and the curse, you Hittites. Come on to me. And Esau says, No thanks, I'd rather run right back under the cloud with the Hittites. I don't want your blessing. A willful rejection. I mean, the very thing Isaac was afraid Abimelech was doing to him, his son is doing to him. That hurts a father's heart. And I think it hurts our Heavenly Father when he sees that which he created turn from him and turn to the enemy and the lies and the deceit of the enemy. And there goes Esau that way. And what is it? It's a grief of mine unto Isaac and Rebekah. It's a grief of mine. I know how hard it is for a mother and a father if they have grown up and, and, and serve the Lord and love the Lord and then the child turns away from that witness and goes out and marries an unsaved person. And how, how difficult it is. You're going to see though Isaac and Rebekah, they're not going to give up on Esau. They're going to continue to love him and pray for them, just like we're supposed to do too. But ultimately, the decision is personal. The responsibility is between one soul and God. So that's how this chapter ends here. I don't even know how to put it. I mean, he trusted his father's God, and yet I guess he watched one of his children turn away. Now we move to the 27th chapter. Do we have some time, Joe, to, to start that this week? And now what we'll see here is in the 27th chapter, Isaac is portrayed as a blesser. Any questions on what we were learning in the 26th chapter before we move on? Now we see him as a father and a husband. We see him as a pilgrim and a stranger. Now we see him as a blesser within his household. This is one of the greatest things that we can have in terms of leaving a heritage is to be able to bless our children. And so now as we begin uh, Genesis chapter 27, we'll start in uh, verse 1 and read a few verses and comment. And, and it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son. And he said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison, and make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Now notice, remember I told you, Isaac's not going to give up on his son. He's going to continue to stay in relationship to him. He doesn't throw him out of the house. <laughs> and he's going he's to continue to, to, to pray for him and to, to bless him any way he can. And here he wants to bestow the blessing upon his son es Esau. Now, in Dr. Wiersbe, he as he outlines this, he says a declining father. And I think what he means is he's getting older. And there's a time, folks, because in these frail bodies that uh, we get over the hill and we start declining. We go on the downside slope. I hit that at about 19. No, no, maybe 21. <laughs> but, but 
I don't know when, but I'm definitely over that hump now and, and heading down. And, and as we're declining, notice, as he's declining, it's still his desire to leave a blessing. It's still his desire to bless rather than to be a burden. Now, he's suffering some physical uh, weaknesses here. It says uh, his eyes were so dim that, that he could not see. Of course, this is a natural thing that happens as the eyesight gets weak. And, and yet, even though he's weak, he still wants to bless his son. He calls his son and he tells him, I want you to go out and make me some of that venison, the meat that I love, because I want to bless you before I die. Now, I did a little study on the ages here. At this particular time, Isaac was about 137 at this time. And you find out he's not going to die for a few decades. So I think he's kind of getting a little ahead of the gun here. I think sometimes what happens is uh, we have times in our lives, you know, as we get over the hill and, and we're declining, and we start thinking that uh, sometimes the big one's a lot closer than it is, you know, like uh, Red Fox used to do is the big one. And, and he's getting a little ahead here because God's still got a lot of work left to do in Isaac's life, a lot of blessing yet to give to Isaac. And Isaac is just getting a little bit ahead of the Lord here. I don't think it was quite time for him to pass the blessing on, which is why I think you're going to see he makes some errors in judgment in this particular chapter. One of the errors of judgment is he wants to give now, he wants to pass the blessing on to Esau. And if you remember, long, long time ago, God had promised that the elder would serve the younger, that the blessing was going to be given to Jacob. And, and Isaac, in the dimness of his sight, and it could refer spiritually to maybe his spiritual sight's a little dim here. And the fact that all through this passage you see things like, um, he says, uh, make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat. And so you're talking about a lot of physical things. He might be getting a little bit more carnal in his old age than spiritual. And you know it's when we get carnal that we kind of confuse the way that the Lord wants to go. Because in our own wisdom, in our own fleshy knowledge, in our own traditions, and here Isaac is living in a land where it's traditional to give the blessing to the eldest son. And Esau is the eldest son. But God had said he's going to give the blessing to the younger son. And so what I'm saying is often what happens is we begin to follow convention when we go carnally. Our, our carnal mind tends to follow convention, and God often does things just contrary to how the world would do them. God wants to do something new here. Yes, Abraham got the blessing. Yes, Isaac got the blessing. But now Jacob is going to get the blessing instead of the older son. God's going to choose the number two here. So, so I just see, uh, what, what I'm saying is this. When you're tired, when you're weak... <laughs> and you're so tempted to go by your own intuition and tempted to go by your own knowledge and your own understanding. And, and this happens to me a lot. And you know where this usually happens? About three or four or five o'clock at work. In the morning, you know, I'm revved up and I have all my strength. But as the day wears on and I've been beaten up a lot, I start to fall back into the old way of doing things. Maybe for the ladies around the time they're making dinner. I mean, I, I don't know because I, I don't make dinner. But I mean, maybe I'm terrible. I can burn toast. If you'd like burned toast, come to my house. That's about all I'm good at. But, but I, it might be around that time. I notice that as we start to decline and we get weak, then the carnal nature starts to take over. And we start to think carnally rather than spiritually. And here the Bible is showing us Isaac is a little weak here. And he's starting to think carnally rather than spiritually. So we see a declining father, and in verse 5, we see, And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son. Of course, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it, and Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. And she says to Jacob, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Now go to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. 
Now, what we see here, not only a declining father, but a doubting mother. The mother's got a little doubt. She's got a little concern here. Why? Because she loves Jacob. We saw earlier that Esau was a man of the field. And Rebekah loved Jacob because he was a man that dwelled in tents. He stayed. He helped around the house. He helped with the household chores. And he listened to mom talk. And he listened to grandpa talk. And he was one of those boys that, that hung around the house. And she really loved him. And she wanted him to get the blessing. Now, God had promised he was going to get the blessing. She, too, gets in the flesh and gets carnal and decides to scheme. Instead of trusting God, she's doubting, well, you know, if, if Isaac is moving ahead with the blessing and I don't see God making a quick move, I better help God out. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're, we're, getting, we're, we're running out of time, so we're going to continue on this next week. And we're going to see how God is going to work this whole chapter out. But we're going to watch a lot of players go in different directions in this chapter. But you're going to watch how God, this is the amazing thing about God. I often think of life <laughs> as like a chessboard. And we're pieces on the chessboard. And God's on one side of the chessboard. And the devil's on the other side. And you know what? The pieces move on their own. Now, this is a rough chess game to play. It's bad enough to play chess when you've got someone moving the pieces. But let's say you move a pawn, and when you turn away, you look back, and all of a sudden the pawn moved three spaces that way. You see, God's in this battle with the devil, and the devil moves his pieces, and God moves one of us his pieces. He turns, and then we move. God's still going to win. God is so good that not only does he move us, he knows which square we're going to run to, and he's still going to orchestrate the whole victory. And you're going to see this in chapter 27, as people are going all different directions, and God is going to sovereignly supervene over this whole thing, and everything is going to work out the way he said it would. We serve a great and a mighty and an awesome God. Just an awesome God. I just can't imagine how he keeps track of six billion people, plus all the host of the angels, plus the devil and his devils doing everything, and he's, he's moving these pieces and watching us run around from square to square. He's still going to get the checkmate in the end. Very interesting. So next week we'll continue. Any questions on what we just were touching on in this chapter before we go? All right, let's pray. Father, these are, are great chapters to, to read and to see how you work in lives and, and also for us to rest to know that even when we make the mistake and we move from a white square to a black square, Lord, you're going to get us back right where you want us and you're going to get the victory you know, because of your name and because of the name of Jesus Christ. And we always have to remember that there's none other name given under heaven, that this is the name by which all men will confess to the glory of God, that Jesus is the Christ, both Lord and Christ. And we lift up that name in praise and adoration. Thank you for what you showed us tonight. And we pray... Lord, this week, that we can go out and carry the banner of Jesus Christ in his name. Amen.